Cool. All right. So um, basis for the conversation, uh, I mean, the idea to actually have the conversation came from either Harks or Tom, I don't remember, but the basis for the conversation is um, a blog that I wrote a while back about um, the potential virtues of high density uh, in data centers, specifically as it relates to um, greater sustainability uh, in the sense that um, uh, generally speaking, if you build high density, you're putting more computers into a smaller footprint from a building standpoint, and that every time you have to build a new building because you've run out of uh, uh, density capacity in your data center, uh, the uh, impact on the environment from building that new building has to be accounted for in your thinking relative to the overall sustainability of your data center strategy. So how much should that or shouldn't that play into your uh, design choices, I think, is part of what we should talk about today. And, uh, you know, realistically, kind of open the conversation up as well, just about sustain, uh, a combination of sustainability in general and uh, high density in general and see where it leads us. Anybody else want to add anything to that? I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, Tom here. <clears throat> um, I, I think on the issue of high-density data centers, Mark, I think you're all going to find us in violent agreement with you. Um, I, I don't, I, I could be wrong, but I don't imagine anyone's going to jump in and go, oh, no, 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 we need to have really low-density data centers for, for any particular reason. Right. Um, and, and as you say, I mean, there are a lot of advantages to high-density data centers. Uh, we, we, all, we all see the way the power consumption of data centers has been going, and it's only been going one direction, and it's going to keep going that direction as servers require more power. Uh, and, and, and the density increases in the rack. Uh, so, you know, it, it makes no sense to go the other direction, uh, just from a practical standpoint, sustainability apart. Uh, from a sustainability perspective, uh, as you say, it makes sense from a, a land use point of view. And I, I, I was interested as well to read James Hamilton's blog post recently about using solar power and the impact that has on, on land use, which are... Right. You know, um, you know, pretty ridiculous if, if you're trying to yeah. power your data center from solar alone, right. which no one, no one right. in the right mind would think about anyway. Yeah. Um, to, to my mind, I mean, a lot of that is very important, but to, to my mind, one of the most important things to make a data center sustainable, and this is just my own particular bias, uh, but it's the it's the generation that's coming into the generation mix that's coming into the data center, um, and the, the classic example of that is the prime bill facility, where they quote a, a PUE of 1.07 or 1.08, depending on when they measure it, but they're you know 70% powered by coal from Pacific right. Core, and of course yeah. that's completely unsustainable. Um, so uh, I, I visited the Vern Global facility in in just outside Reykjavik recently. Uh, right beside Keflavik, in fact, and it's 100% renewable from two different sources. Uh, the, the two sources that power it are um, uh, geothermal and hydro, and it's a fascinating facility. Uh, and t to my mind, it, it's, it's kind of a, a template uh, that will be rolled out even more so in Iceland, and they're going to start, I suspect, uh, I don't suspect, I know in fact, they have plans to put in large fiber uh, coming into Iceland to reduce latency into the islands so that they can become a, a, a cloud uh, country, if you want. They want to export, because they've got an excess of energy, uh, they want to export their energy as kilobytes. Uh, right. And the, the energy in Iceland is 100% renewable. Uh, the electricity, I should say, in Iceland is 100% renewable. And it's also the cheapest energy you can get anywhere in the Western world. Great. Okay. What's the price? The price they quote, uh, the, the price they quote, uh, the, the local utility company is a state-owned utility company whose name escapes me, um, but, it, but it's unpronounceable anyway, even if I could remember. Um, <laughs> it's, it, they quote $43 per megawatt uh, for a 12-year contract, um, so index linked for 12 years, they'll, they'll, they'll guarantee your pricing starting at $43 per megawatt for 12 years. Now, the Vern Global uh, organization for their data center negotiated a 20-year 
uh, power purchase agreements. So you can imagine their pricing would be significantly lower than that. Uh-huh. But even and at forty three dollars per megawatt, that's that's very cheap. And is that fully delivered cost into no transmission distribution and everything else? You know? That that that's everything. That's yeah, that's that's, that's delivered cost. Okay. And that's the, that's what they publicly quote on their website, the website of the utility company. So as I say, you know, you go in there looking for uh, 50 megawatts or 100 megawatts, uh, the price is going to fall very quickly. And they can they guarantee they can roll out uh, 10 megawatts. Um, I think it's within 12 months or something like that from 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 uh, from the time you ask it. They don't have an issue. I mean, they're 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 used to rolling out you know 500 megawatts at a time because they've got aluminium smelting plants on the island, uh, and they don't have an issue with the grid there. It's the second most reliable grid in the world. Uh, that there's no there's no issue on the grid there around reliability at all. Uh, the the the, uh, the smelting plants that are there. Uh, run 24/7, so the the um, the profile of consumption on the grid is flat. You know, there's only 300,000 people who live there, so their impact on the grid is negligible compared to the industry, which goes 24/7. So it's a flat grid. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a very unusual uh, use case, but it's 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 fascinating. No, oh, absolutely. Parks, you want to throw anything in there? Um. I think that's very interesting what you just said, Tom. Um, coming sort of back to the high versus low density um, data center piece, I think you know I think we've all seen the advantages of going to high density. I was just wondering if there was any way in a particular circumstance that we could make a case for low density. So, Mark, when I read the article, you know I saw that there was a um, significant amount of emissions related to the build of the, the, the sort of the construction extension if you were to go to low density. But you know, if right. you were to be able to pick up a a building that's already a shell of a building. You know, um, in the UK we've got examples of um, semiconductor um, factories that were um, no longer needed, and therefore the shell was created, um, and there's a significant amount of power on site because it's going to become a semiconductor plant. Um, but it moved out to the far east. So there are um, certain locations where the shell's already there. So you could argue that's sunk carbon, in essence, in terms of building out a large amount of space. Uh, and the power's already there as well. So I think in under certain circumstances, looking at high versus low density, if you had to go to low density um, and you were then uh, able to, in a colder climate, able to eliminate um, any, most of your mechanical infrastructure because you can bring in the air from external, maybe filter it, push it through the through a data center, and then just push out the hot air out of the side or reuse it for whatever purpose from a sustainability perspective. You, know, you could get rid of all your mechanical plant, so there's the dematerialization of, of the mechanical plant and the chillers. Um, you know, you can probably in the high density environments, you're looking at UPS backing, uh, you know, your fans and your pumps um, because of the densities. You know, you won't have to do that in a low density um, data center. Um, so spreading it out where you know the land's already there um, and the carbon's already sunk and there's no mechanical infrastructure. I understand you would still need. You know, uh, more cabling, um, as an example, um, and so on. But I was just wondering, is there a situation, a scenario, where if you look at overall emissions, and obviously emissions with cement, as an example, are obviously equal across the world, he says, in quotation marks. It depends on where you get delivered from and everything else. Um, but, you know, you're, you're, you have a number of a ton of carbon per ton of cement. You know, that's quite consistent across the world, whereas power, can, uh, power consumption figures, as Tom was saying, vary in terms of its carbon content. So I think, is there a argument that in some situations, in some scenarios, low density from a purely carbon emissions perspective could make sense? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, in the data center market, because the data center is driven so much by what's actually going to be um, the use profile of the facility. In other words, the use profile of a, of a facility like um, the one that Tom referenced uh, of Facebook's in Oregon is extremely different from the use profile of a traditional enterprise data center or of a multi-tenant data center like um, uh, the one I work in here at Switch. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, there's you saying that there's only one answer to any potential problem or opportunity uh, is naive at best. Uh, from a generic uh, perspective, I would say that there is likely opportunities where, using the scenario you've just defined, opportunities where low density might make sense, uh, the, the question really is, 
uh, or the questions really are in my mind when I when I think through that scenario are, is um, the fact that you have low density really doesn't change any of your protection requirements. So it just distributes them more. So if you needed UPS in high density, you still need UPS in low density. The only thing that would determine whether you needed more or less was the tiering of the facility from a protection requirement standpoint uh, because of the applications you supported or because of the technical architecture of the applications you supported. Oh, in the high density environment, would you not UPS yep. back your, your pumps and your fans? Whereas in a lower density environment, you could probably get away with not doing that. So well, I mean, you could you could argue that that's true, but uh, I mean, take for instance the the data center right here, the switch data center. We run in the in the data center of uh, in the data center in the desert of Nevada, um, uh, where most people would consider it to be fairly hot, and yet seventy plus percent of the year we can run on outside air exclusively. Um, and you know, while yes, those uh, devices potentially need backup, the truth is is that unless you're creating some form of um, natural flow air environment, um, you know, where it some sort of induction process where it actually collects the air without mechanical assistance, doesn't do any, uh, you know, purification or modification of the air as it's coming into the facility, then there's still considerable amount of, um, of HVAC gear and mechanical gear that's required. Um, so where, where you might save, though, is if you're doing low density, then you would save to some degree on some of the additional, um, uh, I don't want to say safety, but some of the additional um, uh, technical design requirements uh, that are built into a high density environment, right? So if you if you build a a lower density space and um, you know from a tiering perspective all things are equal with a with an equivalent to a higher density space, but you can build it in a brownfield environment where um, you know, the building only requires some minor, minor retrofit in order to make it active. Um, then really the question, uh, I re really think the question boils down to is, is it from a technical perspective for your business the right thing to do to create a low density environment where um, you're building for what's in use today or even what was in use from last year or the year before and, you know, five or six years from now, any UPS you have in place, any PDUs that you have in place or whatever potentially now become um, roadblocks to being able to successfully expand the utilization of that facility. And so at some point, we run out of uh, you know, extra buildings to fill with data center capacity. And we're now uh, you know, bulldozing land and, and building more facilities where in a, in a true high density environment compared to the average low density environment today, uh, you could easily say it's a four to one ratio, right? A four four data centers to one high density data center. And so, you don't, uh, I, you, don't, you think go ahead. power consumption um, per server is going to continue to increase, or do you think we're going to? No, well, it's not so much the power. Efficiency. Yeah, it's it the efficiency will continue to increase. Um, there's no doubt, but efficiency has continued to increase for the last 20 years. Yeah. And it hasn't changed the fact that our density continues to grow, and so therefore our power draw in a smaller space continues to grow. The benefit is that it doesn't grow in a in a true um, you know uh, 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 yeah. comparison to how much compute capacity we have, but it, nonetheless we find every year we provide more compute capability to our customers through you know faster, cheaper processors and memory and disk. Um, and more software options, and people find more ways to use more of it, right? So um, the, the it's fact is, is that, exactly, yeah, or Jevons paradox, you know, it's all the same, right? I mean, and it, it's, um, so the fact is, is that average densities were, you know, 2 kW per rack um, in 2003, 2004. They were 4 kW between 2006 and 2009. Now they're more like 6 to 7 and realistically, the average density will probably be around 12 three years from now. And, you know, I've even talked to people that are looking to put some of the atom chip solutions in place, like yeah. the ones created by um, C-Micro, the company that uh, AMD recently yeah. bought. But they're talking yeah. about such densities in a single rack that they're still looking at 14 or 15 kW per cabinet because they're, they're, they're getting more out of the dollar they're spending 
but they're putting more on it, right? And yep. Yep. so I, I just I think we're I think we're fooling ourselves if we think we've somehow solved the problem for any period of time. I think we'll see dips in utilization, but the idea that we've actually solved the problem and now we're at a flat line for some significant period of time, I, I think we'd be yeah. fooling ourselves to believe that. That point, yeah, I agree. Now, uh, is, is uh, it, I want to just me. Is, is it just me, or is is Hark's audio very muffled? It is a little bit muffled, yeah. Okay. Oh, Hark's, is there any way you can get closer to your phone, or? Um, I'm on my I'm on my cell phone, so uh, I'll try and move to somewhere where there's maybe a bit better reception. Cool. Okay, great. So yeah, I mean, from from my perspective, you know, and and, I, and we all have a unique view into where we're going. And there's you know there's there's even different um, customer strategies and and uh, vendor strategies depending on what region you're in. Uh, but certainly, what I've seen, uh, you know, i.e. EU versus APAC versus North America, et cetera. Um, but what I've really seen is that um, more and more of the folks that are putting uh, large scale infrastructure into our facilities are trying to pack as much as they possibly can into the smallest possible footprint. I mean, Tom, you were here just recently. You must have yep. seen how many 54U racks we have that are stuffed floor to ceiling with servers. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so that's, so that's so not unusual. Them, 25. Yeah, so, I saw a slew of them, uh, 40 together that were 25 uh, kilowatts per rack. That's right. That's right. And even, even just the storage arrays, are taken um, between 6 and 10 kW per cabinet. And there was literally dozens and dozens of storage arrays packed next to each other uh, for one client alone, right? And so um, when you think about the fact that uh, storage is becoming a bigger component of what we're doing and density for storage continues to increase as well, um, even just from a storage perspective, the idea of creating four or five kW cabinets just doesn't make sense anymore. Right. Yeah. Plus, yeah. it doesn't give you any flexibility if you build to four or five kW, and you're guaranteed to always use at least that much in every cabinet because of the storage yeah. component or because you've put one set of blade servers in there. Now you have no flexibility for when you do need some racks that have higher that must have higher density because of architecture design or whatever. Right. And so, because exactly. you know, we talk about the the, the SuperNAP here, but the reality is is that we would never want to put. 25 to 28 kW in every cabinet, what we want to be able to do is create a density that makes sense from a distribution standpoint so that it's the most value to our customers and the most value to us, right? And and if we were to start with an average of 4 or 5 or 6 kW per cabinet, I mean, we would end up leaving more than half of our data center empty because we'd be out of capability to cool it. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, I mean it, it, it's like I said earlier. The 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 density per rack is only going one direction. Where do you yeah, think? In fact, I, 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 where, do, where do you think it might stop or plateau, or will it never? Sorry. Uh, I was saying, where do you think it is going to go up to? What kind of numbers, or, or where do you think it might plateau? Or do you think it's just going to well, keep it neutralized? Do you know? I, I I don't know that there are so many so many quotes on this kind of stuff from the past with Bill Gates saying, you know, no one will ever need more than 128K of RAM and uh, yeah. Thomas Watson saying no one will ever need more than five, the world will never need more than five computers. I, I wouldn't want to put a number on it because I could be proved well wrong, you know, in 10, 15 years' time. I, I honestly don't know. I, I have no idea. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, live in a, I live in an apartment and it's, it's a large apartment, it's a nice apartment. We've got a breaker on on the circuit that if we draw more than five kilowatts, the breaker throws. So our, our apartment can't draw more than five kilowatts. Now we can contact the utility and have that increased if we want. But I'm I'm happy to keep it at that because you know it rarely it rarely it rarely goes over the five kilowatts. But it brings it home to me. Our our entire apartment rarely draws more than five kilowatts. And I was looking at individual racks in switch which are drawing down 25 kilowatts and I saw 40 of them beside each other. That's one megawatt in a cage. And, you know, just that that blows my mind. Five of our apartments in a single rack and then multiply that right. by 40 in, in a cage smaller than the room and then now. It's just yeah. it's, it's insanity. It's insanity. But that's where it's right. going. Right, and, and the, the hard part here, I mean, and I, I would, uh, Harks, I would uh, completely echo what Tom said relative to trying to pick a number. 
Um, uh, because, you know, there, the truth is, is that there are any number of technologies that are being developed today that look to be too expensive. And so historically, many of us in IT have made the mistake of saying, oh, we shouldn't head in that direction because it's too expensive to do it that way. Well, if we had headed in that direction, by the time we were ready to actually benefit from it, it wouldn't be too expensive anymore, right? So whether it's whether it's water cooled uh, or whether it's dipped racks or whatever it is, that what we don't want to do, you know, whether you're on the sustainability side or not, what we don't want to do is create a scenario like uh, the telecom providers could potentially um, throttle, or the or the cable providers could potentially throttle the growth of cloud because they're trying yeah. to limit people's ability to use the network. And if we do yeah. that in our data centers, or if we do that and say, sorry, you know, you, we just decided that um, air cooling is uh, maxed out is 25 kW per cabinet, so don't do anything, then somebody else will just figure out a way around it. But in the meantime, we'll just be slowing business opportunity, right? That's a fair point. So what's, what's your now, thoughts on... Um, Moving from so you know moving from legacy data centers is it better retrofitting legacy data centers? I, I know this really depends on the data center, it depends on the power, it depends on the configuration, everything else, right? But at a principal level, what are your thoughts on um, refreshing legacy data centers versus moving to a greenfield and starting from scratch? Do you guys have any um, thoughts on that? Tom, why don't you go ahead and go first? I'll follow. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, the, it, it, it's, it's a very vague question, Arx, and the, there will always be exceptions that go against yeah. this. But my, my own my own gut would be to retrofit rather than go for greenfield build. Yeah. And a lot of that is around the the, um, the use of land, number one, and also the, uh, the, the, the environmental consequences of a new build. Um, <clears throat> Like I said, th there will always be exceptional cases where that doesn't prove to be the case, uh, but yeah, of I, I, I would say retrofit would be the first option to look at anyway. And do you think yeah, it's retrofit it's, and drive to higher densities or as high as you can in the legacy environment? Do you think that's probably to try and get the most compute capability within the retrofitted space? I think that's absolutely. probably what makes sense, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, and, and, yeah, so I mean, I would add... A, a, Add a little bit to what you just said, and then and then what uh, the original question as well. I would say that it, at that point, it really, um, as much as I hate to say this, because I uh, I love the sustainability aspect of the conversation all the time, it really just boils down to the money factor, right? Um, it what what's what's driving your need for data center space? What's the criticality of that need? Where is your data center? Um, can you control the data center better when you retrofit it, or will it still be suboptimal? Um, is the building itself built to be um, capable of supporting the the availability and the and the structural requirements of a of a real data center environment? Is that something you need? Right, so all of those. I mean, there's there's just a hundred questions I would ask somebody before I suggested they go one way or the other. But all of those questions have to be determined first, and then just one of those questions, sort of like a site selection process, you know, generically speaking, yeah. one of those questions has to be what's the sustainability factor of being putting there. I mean, it's like. As much as I love what the Facebook guys have done, you know, I even had conversations with Tom, um, uh, some of them not, not always, you know, completely um, uh, uh, happy, but uh, I didn't, you know, I, I was, didn't like the idea of them building in Oregon, but I do like the fact that they've made it open. They've, they've put um, the equivalent of a platform of opportunity out in front of people for them to adopt as they see opportunity presents, and it is a very efficient model, but... Again, there's no for the average owner operator uh, or colo provider or hosting provider. There's really no way they can take a, a, a blueprint of what um, uh, Facebook or Google or Yahoo have done and try to turn that into an enterprise class data center because those data centers are designed to be a computer in a string of computers, right? And that's that's a very different availability metric. It's a very different redundancy metric. It's a very different um, overall uh, facility design metric than what an enterprise data center, at least in my mind, needs to be. And, you know, the other issues, of course, with, um, you know, from a short-term uh, 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 strategy standpoint, doing a brownfield is how much more 
can I get out of this facility and how much is it going to cost me to do that retro um, versus doing a greenfield if I can only get five years but I'm spending two-thirds of the cost of building something that would last me 15 years or not building at all and going to use someone else's facility then that doesn't make sense at all right so it yeah, really is a one of those in the end it's really what makes sense for your business at the time yeah I suppose you're right so it's business requirements <clears throat> it's looking at TCO and looking at the future but the TCO even looking at sort of retrofit versus building um, greenfield um, you know the TCO if it's marginal and it's a few percent out or five percent out, you could argue that the risk of a new, uh, of a new build, you might just retrofit the existing because of the risk of go, doing the new and all the migrations and everything else, all the uncertainty. Um, so yeah, it's definitely uh, it's definitely an interesting one. But also, I suppose yeah. it's about time to deliver as well because if you retrofit, depending on how you do that, you could possibly deliver quicker than going greenfield, trying to find a site, getting planning permission, getting power, getting network connectivity, doing all those other things which might take you um, a little while longer than using existing invested and sunk um, costs in infrastructure that's already there. So it's, it's yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. yeah, the bottom line is you have to Retro put a prioritized matrix. Yeah. yeah, and retrofits can always be done piecemeal, you know, whereas a, a new build has to be done, you know, in parallel and then a switchover. Right, yeah, so. right. Guys, can I, can I add something um, here? So uh, basically we see a trend at the moment um, you know, from from my company's point of view, a lot of our clients they are actually going down the retrofit uh, um, uh, road mm -hmm. simply because the buildings, especially in the sort of Eastern Europe, Russia uh, part of the world, because there are a lot of big um, um, factory type buildings um, that are running out of business. There's no point for them to sort of have factories inside the cities. So a lot of the big telcos are sort of buying them up. For the main region A, they can deploy them a lot faster because the building is up and running. Um, it's a factory type building, so the loads, the weight loads are, are there. And number three, these buildings come with a massive amount of power already um, included in the plot. So um, certainly in that part of the world, that's the favorite option. Um, my, my point is that I think, um, I mean, my, my personal view is that retrofitting is actually, um, you know, a lot more sustainable and green. Because um, I mean, there's studies uh, on the not the data center industry, but um, you know, it's um, office houses is is a lot more uh, carbon um, uh, neutral to sort of uh, retrofit because the um, you know embodied carbon is already done. Um, so um, I, I would be in favor of that. My only um, concern or question is. If you retrofit uh, an existing building into a data center, so you're already, you know, making some compromises. And if you're only planning to build it um, as a data center, you know, engineering can overcome that and actually deliver you a pretty good building. But um, my question is that what happens five years down the line or ten years down the line? Because if um, basically density is going up and up, it's, we, you know, we're going to reach a point that we're not going to be able to do that with air. So we're going to have to start thinking about retrofitting the cooling again to meet the high density. So I think that's where um, a lot of people, especially in Europe, uh, because, you know, don't forget, you know, Central East Asia, you know, Europe or Russia, they're just coming on board now. But if we're talking about, you know, London, Paris, Amsterdam, these guys are pretty up on the high density already. So they, they will be looking very soon at replacing, um, you know, the, the fresh air cooling and the free cooling and moving to the sort of liquid cooling. So. Um, you know, it adds an extra uh, bit into the equation, and the other part is none of these, none of the governments incentivize retrofitting buildings um, to be data centers rather than knocking them down and start buildings from scratch. So um, that's the only two points I want to add, really. Yeah, think, and uh, sorry, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Harks. I was going to say, I think Mahalis makes a great point around you know, future-proofing your data center. You know, we always talk about right. life cycles. If you talk about yep. building life cycles, um, I mean, I, I looked at one of your references on your blog, uh, Mark, um, I yep. forget which one it was, but they talked about the building um, life cycle, or useful life for a building, is 50 years, life expectancy. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of them get retrofitted before hitting 50 years, but I mean, even if you look at a data yep. center, you know, you've got components that are 20, 15, 10 years useful life, and then you start going yep. down to you know, servers and blades, and if you look at blade chassis, they don't get refreshed as often as, as some of the blades do now, and 
the Bay chassis, you could argue, has, especially in the historical traditional way of the server, with power supply mm-hmm. and the fans are in the Blade chassis. So if that isn't being refreshed as often, you're not getting those those benefits from generational changes. So interesting. I mean, you, I think Mark touched one earlier about sort of moving beyond air cooling. And, and I think, you know, we've all talked about between us in the past, looking at things like liquid cooling directly to the to the server. And so, you know, one of the things I always say in terms of future proofing is you could potentially, as you design your data center, um, you know, put your power and your data cables overhead. Um, firstly, in today's designs, that frees up the underfloor for better air, um, so no air blockages. But in the future, you may want to pipe under there and have some kind of liquid, which is going to each of the racks as well, so you can start cooling some of these potentially future generations of, of, of equipment. But it's always an interesting yeah, one, future proof in the data. It, it is, and I mean, and that's and that's actually um, interestingly enough. I mean, that's the hard part of the hard discussion relative to retrofitting a facility, right? Is that um, it sounds like you can easily retrofit a facility, but I've done a lot of work in data centers, and I can tell you that um, uh, it's a gut wrenching experience to do any serious upgrades within an active data center, right? Um, and if you're running, you know, major corporate activities in in the data center, whether it's your ERP solution for an enterprise, or uh, you know, email, or you know, the corporate networks are run out of there, or anything like that, uh, or you're, uh, you know, an eBay or an Amazon or something like that, the idea of actually working within a facility in any serious way, um, you know, scares the hell out of the average uh, data center manager. Not to mention the application owners and everyone else. So that uh, always is a consideration. But beyond that, Harks, I think your you know your your talk about you know the longevity, et cetera, is that uh, you know if you can retrofit again, if you can retrofit, do it successfully, and do it the way you would have done it, um, planning a 15-year facility, then you're making an uh, an accurate apples to apples comparison of you know building uh, green or retrofitting. And that's all you really should do for your business, right? If you can justify it, then uh, then it should be the right choice. But uh, to, to do any major shortcuts uh, for some short-term um, perceived benefit, whether it's perceived cost benefit or anything else, um, uh, by doing a, a brownfield um, uh, rebuild, uh, runs the risk of you just putting your environment and uh, your data center up for repair again four or five years down the road. And and generally speaking, um, you know you want to you want to put the right things in place that allow you that allow you to modularly use modularity to adjust tiering, to adjust how much power you deliver, to adjust how much air you deliver, et cetera, without having to affect the overall availability of the facility. And it's very hard to do that with um, uh, you know, a brownfield uh, rebuild, generally speaking. Fair point. Yeah. So where do we go from here? Uh, I had one other question, Mark, that uh, I wanted yeah. to ask. In, in the article, and I, I've heard this not just in your article, but in other things as well, when they look at um, embedded carbon, you know, there's a couple of links there that talked about, you know, 18% of the emissions is related to embedded carbon. Um, right. of the building, as an example. Uh, and then they say, oh, the use space is X percentage. Um, do a lot of those those benchmarks that are out there, do they refer to normal office buildings? Because if you look at the, the emissions of a data center over its life cycle, they're going to be, you know, because of the power densities, especially with the higher density stuff, it's going to be much higher than a typical office building. So, you know, is the embedded carbon percentage, is that smaller just because of the way we use a data center? I would I would think so, but I wanted to get your opinions no, it's it's a great question, and the truth is is that uh, I did uh, some research to try to find better detail, but I couldn't find anything specific to data centers. And so what I did to try to level the playing field, and I'd love to get everybody's field uh, feedback on on whether they think I was successful. But what I was truly trying to do to level the playing playing field was talk specifically about the cement, right, as opposed to um, other structural uh, aspects of building a data center versus building an office building. So. Well, uh, an office building may have uh, may use less power and therefore seem to have a lower carbon footprint over time than a traditional data center. A data center also uh, potentially has significantly more in the way of infrastructure built into it 
from a um, from an impact to the environment standpoint. I mean, if you think about what it takes to build UPSs and all those batteries, what it takes to build um, all the extra copper, uh, all the extra ladder racking, all the extra racks, all the extra um, the extra thick cement that's needed because of the weight restriction uh, or the weight requirements for high density gear, et cetera, et cetera. You start to realize that. Um, well, I don't know if you realize it, but that was my assumption that at some point the the impact, because the 18% was used for an average building, not not for specifically for a data center build, I felt that because I couldn't find a number to accommodate uh, the impact of all the power and cooling gear uh, being bought separately and put into a data center, I felt uh, trying to compare it on sort of the cement alone uh, uh, and leaving out the long-term power draw was the best I could do to try to make it apples to apples. Yeah, I think we need some kind of industry research on it, don't we? Just to, to no, ab absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, great question. <laughs> you know me, Mark. What's that? <laughs> I think you know me, Mark. I always <laughs> yep. have them. No, that's, wonderful questions. that's good. That's excellent. Yep. So what I uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of kind of, what I would be interested in, if anybody on the call is interested, is, is at some point, even if it's not today, is talking about how to future-proof the data center. So as we build data centers for you know 15, 20 years useful life, you know, what is the answer to make them? Um, future proof enough that they can take 15 generation of blades. They can take, you know, I suppose there's, there's, there's sort of generations and there's innovations, right? So generations are yep. the stuff that comes out every year. And then there's real innovation. So if you went from an air-cooled server to a liquid-cooled server, or from a, you know, an AC-powered server to a DC-powered server, those kind of things, which I know are religious debates as well. Um, it would be interesting to say how would, or how could we set up and build data centers to take advantage of that kind of infrastructure and, and the the changes that happen going forward. And the answer might be containers and modularizing it all, but it'd be, be interesting to have a further debate on that if anybody else is. No, I'd, I'd be interested in doing that. I mean, I sort of touched on that a little bit uh, in one of my earlier answers about the idea of, you know, building in modularity so that you can add more um, cooling and power as, you, as necessary. For instance, the building we have here, while already built to fairly high density um, and with a significant amount of cooling, there's actually enough space in all of our power rooms to add another 100 megawatts worth of power into the facility. Um, and, uh, you know, for, but because we're, generally speaking, supporting all um, high availability environments, uh, it's built to the highest tier level as a data center as a whole. But going forward, I really think, and I agree that this would be a great debate, is to talk about how, where are the overlaps and where are the opportunities um, to build uh, uh, the future into your data center and and not make just assumptions that, you know, it's tiering or it's being able to add more power or, or whatever, because there are a lot of uh, potential complex a answers to that question uh, around, you know, will you will you want to be able to pipe in a liquid? Will you um, want to be able to um, uh, create some sort of centralized networking core that your, that your cores are plugging into? I mean, who knows what the future data center is going to look like? So an interesting part of that discussion will be really starting kind of um, 15 or 20 years from now, thinking what do we think uh, might be in a data center, and then working our way backward, right? Exactly. And then leaving it quite open so that if there are obviously there's likely to be a lot of innovations outside of what we probably think as well, but leaving it open enough that the data centers can take advantage of those. Right, exactly. All right, guys. Well, I probably should wrap up. I've got to go meet some folks in about 10 minutes, and I've got to go find them. Um, but this was fun. I mean, we didn't have uh, anywhere near the kind of debate that our audience or perceived audience may <laughs> have been hoping for uh, because we're generally speaking, uh, you know, all, all pretty much in agreement on this. But um, uh, it's it's outstanding to get an opportunity to talk with guys like you and, and to test, uh, you know, um, our thinking against each other and, and see whether or not uh, at least we feel like we're um, heading down the right path, not only for our customers, but for the folks that we represent. Um, so it's all good stuff. And, and Harks, I like the idea of doing another one about the future of the data center, so let's plan on yep. doing that. And yep. um, let's uh, figure out how we can make uh, uh, some or all of this recording available to folks uh, if they're interested.